Good evening, everybody. The Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology are, um, as always, delighted to welcome you all to this the seventh and actually the final um, episode of our series of talks for 2021-2022. Um, I'm Patricia Camilleri, President of the Archaeological Society Malta, and uh, I shall be mediating as usual, this evening's session. Uh, I'd like to ask you all to make sure that uh, you're muted um, and uh, um, so that we can avoid odd noises. And uh, I'd like to inform everybody officially that this talk is being recorded. Um, the use of your own video, of course, is totally optional. Uh, all this season's lectures have been a collaboration between the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University of Malta and the Archaeological Society Malta. Thanks, as always, go to the head of department, Dr. John Betts, and to Professor Nicholas Bella, ASM Vice President, who is our link between the society and the department. Um, as usual, I shall proceed this evening by introducing our guest speaker, who is Mr. David Cardona then turning the virtual floor over to David. Um, please do ask uh, as many questions as you like using the chat at any time during the talk. You can, uh, you can just write them down. Then we'll, we'll, I'll be having a look at them um, uh, during when, when, uh, when David's speaking. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I will be asking David to answer at least some of those queries um, as time allows, of course. Uh, and this evening's lecture is uh, um, entitled Landscapes of Death and Commemoration, Preliminary Results and Ongoing Works. So let's move on. Um, David Cardona has uh, always regarded himself as an archaeologist with a very broad range of interests. Uh, the archaeology of uh, architecture and ancient technologies has always fascinated him. And he has researched the use of stone within buildings on the Maltese Islands in the prehistoric uh, period in fulfillment of his Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology. While his master's uh, thesis dealt with the architectural decoration of Roman buildings on Malta and Gozo which um, culminated in his recent publication, The Architecture of Roman Malta. And I'd just like to add here that uh, if anyone hasn't seen it yet, uh, please do go and look at it. It really is a very, very um, enthralling uh, and uh, very interesting publication. And uh, I, I, I recommend it. And it's a good read as well. He's currently undertaking a doctoral, doctoral research, Landscapes of Death and Commemoration, Burial Space, Place and Evolution from Phoenician to Late Roman Malta. At, uh, he's doing this with the University of Leicester under the supervision of Professor Sarah Scott and Professor Neil Christie. Um, and this presentation is uh, a work in progress um, of the, the work that he's doing for his, for his PhD. Uh, he currently holds the position of senior curator for Phoenician, Roman and medieval sites within Heritage Malta and director of Skavark, Heritage Malta's commercial, um, commercial archeology span arm. So I now give the floor over to David. Hi, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Trisha. Uh, as we said, we'll be dealing with the landscapes uh, of death and commemoration uh, within Malta, which is part of, of my uh, doctoral research currently being undertaken uh, at, uh, sorry, something else, uh, at the University of Leicester. Now, the starting point for this research was uh, that during my work, my day-to-day -day work, uh, as curator of 
of Roman and Phoenician sites, I noticed that there is a lack of cohesive interpretation. Uh, that means that tombs and symmetries within the landscape and surrounding elements have rarely been studied within these landscapes and surrounding elements. I'm, and I'm portraying here a typical uh, plan, a section of a catacomb uh, that shows the stairs and the site stops at the stairs. So, so there is no uh, continuation of the sites beyond the hypogea or the tombs themselves. So we're talking about tombs and underground burials in isolation with complete, almost complete disregard to what is happening above and around. Um, uh, so I created this overarching research uh, question and it was basically divided in two. First, can we identify an evolution of form, uh, size and practices in the tombs and symmetries around the ancient Roman town of Melite? Uh, and can we identify any relationships between them and the landscape and settlements and features, features around them? To this are related a number of sub-research questions. We'll go through them uh, a bit quickly. The first one was how far or well, uh, if at all, uh, can we, uh, can the main symmetries around the ancient city of Melita and their extents between the Phoenician and Byzantine periods be identified? How many of these symmetries were single use or multi period use? So have they been used only in the Phoenician period or do they straddle uh, more than one period under study? Uh, whether we can identify any stylistic, decorative, and characteristic physical traits uh, in these tombs and catacombs and the symmetries themselves throughout the different periods, uh, do clusters of barriers and symmetries show changes in shape, size, and location uh, throughout the different periods? Uh, what can we construct of the landscape context and setting of these various sites? Because, of course, we're looking at the landscape today, not necessarily reflecting uh, the landscape uh, 2,000 years ago. Is there any clear relationship between the underground barriers and features found in direct connection with the tombs and catacombs? Uh, how did the tombs and catacombs develop in style and architectural form? These are all tying with each other. And then we have the one marked in red. And this is what can these underground sites and features and features connected with them tell us about the beliefs and rituals of the people making use of them. And this is marked in red for a purpose because even though we have a lot of tombs and hypogea, uh, only a handful have been excavated uh, scientifically. So the ritual being carried out in these tombs, that is, obtain the information of which is obtained through artifacts mainly and uh, the position shape uh, are missing so so this had to go out of the research so it will not be tackled almost at all with some exceptions that we'll see later on uh, but we continue on how good are the current our current data sets and what are the main gaps and needs to understand these various sites so this is important in every research uh, to identify the gaps in the research and thus help authorities and future research to be directed towards those gaps. Can we draw on evidence for, from other sites like Sicily and North Africa to enhance our understanding of these tombs and symmetries? And to these then are the research objections. So from these questions, we formulated the, the research objectives. So the first research objective was to assess and identify the current status of studies and evidence based for tombs and symmetries in water. So what is the current status of, of study? The second is plotting and mapping the burial sites to contextualize the symmetries around the main city of Melite by identifying the extents and location in relation to the town, landscape, and other features, and one another. So the relationship between the symmetries is, is also very, very important. Number, number three uh, is to analyze the use of tombs and symmetries through the various phases, through the examination of tomb contents, shape, and, and location. 
Uh, number four is to assess any characteristic, style, and stylistic decorative and physical traits within burial symmetries and landscape over the different periods of use. And analyze possible differences, continuity, and development or lack of stylistic and architectural forms within the different types of burials, as well as how these, these happened. Number six is to identify any gaps, as I said, in and issues in current archaeological assessment and understanding of these sites to propose future approaches. So, so one of the aims is actually to, to act as a springboard to, to future, future research. Now, to conduct this research, of course, we selected the, the research area, and this is the extent of my, of my area. So we have uh, the main town of Merlita in purple there in the middle, and the orange is delimitating the area of research uh, for, this, for this PhD. And of course, to be able to carry out this research, I had to create uh, a base map, okay? And this is thanks to, to agencies like the Planning Authority. So we have the, the aerial, uh, the satellite imagery of, of the area, uh, onto which we have the line drawing. So, so we also have the surveys uh, to go with it. Uh, I also uploaded the contour maps of the area that are imperative, in my opinion, to, to understand the landscape. Uh, to that, uh, I uploaded the digital terrain model. So this is a model that is color coding according to the height. Uh, and I also uploaded the old admiralty charts uh, from the early 20th century uh, because of course, the landscape has changed a lot. So a lot of buildings that we see today were not there at the time. So it is important, given that I, be, I was also dealing with uh, past research, uh, these were imperative to understand uh, which fields, for example, are which uh, in, a, in a landscape where these fields are no longer existing. Uh, this was also uploaded uh, onto Malta's geological map. And thanks to Keith Bohajar, Bohajar and, and Brian Restal, I also obtained the data for the natural springs in the area, which are the red dots uh, on, this, on this plan. So this created the basis, the base onto which all the research, all the data capture was going, was going to happen. And then came the phase of the data capture. Okay, and the data capture had a lot a lot of uh, different methodologies. One of them, of course, was the desktop research. And the desktop research, I am showing here, for example, uh, desktop research of old notebooks. I am showing here an example of, of the notebooks of Zamit, an example of the notebooks of Bellanti, and a typical publication, a typical plan as published by Caruana, for example, in the, in the late 19th century. But to this, uh, I had also access to to the archive within the National Museum of Archaeology. Um, and these are a number of uh, two examples of old photographs uh, of sites. I was also very, very lucky, and here I have to thank the superintendents, uh, to be given access to the archives of the superintendent. So, so I had quite a good base of data uh, through which I could capture as much as I could, uh, as much as I could, uh, from the oldest excavations in the early, early 20th century up to 2018, and that was our cutoff date uh, for data, data collection. Now, this desktop research was coupled with field walking, okay? Uh, an extensive field walking exercise <clears throat> throughout the entire area marked, marked in the previous plan. And the field walking was important for a number of reasons, but most important of which is because I had to identify both documented and undocumented features. So uh, what does this mean? Uh, we have a lot of features of which we know, for example, the area, but have never been left in the exact location. Now, in some occasions, uh, we were lucky that we could actually identify them, uh, identify them with actual features on site. Most of the time, though, unfortunately, we couldn't. Okay, so, so, in my database, there might be some overlaps because, 
for example, Zamit mentions uh, five barriers in a particular area, I find uh, three of them. So it is always an uncertainty which is which. So we, I, I basically collected the data for, for both. Uh, and the feedback exercise also gave me the opportunity to discover some undocumented features and sites. Uh, and we'll see examples of these a bit later on. Most importantly, though, the field walking exercise allowed me to experience the landscape. So only by walking, you can experience how people viewed the different types of landscape. I'm not talking about the fields here, but primarily about the hill. And I'm here with Imtarfa at my back. I'm from on the western edge of Imtarfa, overlooking Alilia, which is the hill right in the background. So unless you walk these stretches, you will never get a feel of why a particular hill was cho chosen and what, what it looked like for them uh, overlooking uh, a vast necropolis like Alilia, for example. And this is another example uh, of the landscape. And I chose this photo for a reason, because this illustrates one of the main problems, so to say, about the field walking exercise. Because mine was not a typical field walking exercise where I went into straight lines and collected pottery. That was not the aim of the exercise. But of course, the fact that a lot of land in question was arable land, is still arable land, affects the number of, of sites and features uh, that can be identified in quite a long a bit of stretch of the area in question. Of course, there are issues. Uh, there were sites that I couldn't enter uh, as this chap was making it quite clear. And once you look at the Google image of this field, for example, you see a number of cartridges that are visible that I could not access, hence have been left undocumented. Now, oh, the result is this. So here we have a map of the fields of the tracts uh, that, are, that have been surveyed, walked. Uh, the, yellow, the yellow is our sites uh, for that for which I had access, but mostly had no features. The green are sites in which features have been documented, uh, whereas the reds are sites uh, that have not uh, been accessible, that were not accessible, accessible to me. Uh, to those, of course, we must add the buildings in both in Tarfa and, and Rabat. Although we do have, uh, there are some patches of green there that are barely visible. Uh, that we do, so we do have sites that have, have been seen, and that, that's mostly data coming from the superintendents, and for which we have good, good data to go with this project. Now, the data plotting was also multi-tiered. So I separated the data into different typologies. Uh, I had shaft and chamber tombs and shaft and shaftless tombs, surface, surface barriers. Uh, I had hypogea, shaftless hypogea as well. So I differentiated between, even in the shaft and chamber tombs, I differentiated between uh, shaft and chamber tomb and shaftless tombs. So tombs dug into a cliff or in a quarry. Uh, I cataloged rats, uh, quarries, uh, and agricultural trenches, basically. And this led, of course, oops, this led, one of the consequences of this was the relocation of, I am calling them lost sites. So sites for which we had the general area, but could not have, did not have uh, the exact location, and, and I'm using Tatcha as a case study. So the first excavation, documented excavation at, at Tatcha, it was by Zamit in 1906, where he excavated these, these two fields, and this is the plan as published by uh, Claudia Sagona. And this is where the different layers of the database come into play. Uh, when you compare the fields in the area of Tatcha, this field is quite easy to identify uh, with the one basically where part of it is under the parking in front of Peter the Potter. So we could, I could easily map, map this out. Of course, there will always be some discrepancy between, uh, between the actual plan and the admiralty charts, for example. So they don't always, always match. And this has to do 
uh, with the different type techniques of surveying, for example, uh, different measurings. Uh, but this this allowed us at least to identify this is quite that is the same field. Okay, the other site in 1907, what is normally called referred to as Tacha in U Street, um, which is not as Claudia Sagona uh, interprets uh, today's Cosmana Navarra, but it was literally today's street ferries, okay, which was being built at the time. And the location of this field was identified through, through this plan of the hy one hypogeum found amongst uh, a field of shaft and chamber tombs. And we are lucky that this plan, uh, done in 1907, also contained the location of, of the hypogeum within a small, a small inset survey, site plan, uh, which is not always, always the case, but site plans like this then allow us to identify the site within the current, current landscape that, as you can see, has changed completely. So if we overlap the plans, then we can map, map these tombs with hypogeum, which is the blue rectangle in the lower left corner, and the shafting chamber tombs, uh, the pink rectangles, and the rest of the field. And these tie roughly with the current houses uh, there are in this stretch. So, so technically, we can literally pinpoint the exact house where these hypogea and tombs have, have been discovered. In the same year, Zamit also excavated a field called Tamarchel. And uh, this took some investigation work because I couldn't really find a field that tallied with the measurements provided by Zamit. But uh, someone in the area told me that the Tamarchel family still lived there. And they showed me the, the, the the actual house, uh, and that house falls within my primary target field. So, so the fields that fit the best this description by Zamit. So these fields are tentatively, uh, literally the last few plots before the Tachai Tacha windmill. This is also an area that was being developed uh, at the time. Strangely enough, if you look at the surveys uh, of on, on the planning, uh, planning servers of the plans of 1968, these plots uh, appear to have been left bare up to at least 1968. So these tombs were still visible, visible by then. Uh, then in 1910 and 1951, we have this famous uh, site with this particular tomb. And this is, was one of around 30, 30 tombs uh, cleared by a farmer, and this is the only tomb some meets, some meets records. And this tomb after 19, 1910 was literally lost until it was documented again in 1951 during the, the eastern extension of, of, of today's middle school. So, so we can literally tie this to this field here, and this ties nicely then uh, with part of some of the some of the 90 burials found underneath the current, current middle school. So we again, here we have an overlap, and it is very possible, uh, not possible, it is, it is one of the tombs uh, that are lying underneath the school today. So one day we may actually uh, find it again. And Yilchilia is coming and going. <laughs> uh, people are coming in, okay. Uh, so, this ties nicely, this is, provides a picture, a clear picture of our sites. And by doing this exercise, we have a very clear picture of this area. So this, as we will see, ties nicely with the rest of the, of the zone, especially when one also includes the 1968 discoveries of about four dozen uh, tombs in the, the, the primary school that was extended in 1968, and the hypogeum, uh, that blue dot, uh, light blue dot, that is the only one for which we have an exact, an exact location. The others, uh, that's why they're in dots and not rectangles. Uh, the others, unfortunately, we don't. So, but we know that under this school, uh, we have at least four dozen more, more barriers. And these, these have to be seen in, con in conjunction with the rest of the area. So this is 
uh, and an overview of all the tombs and hypogea found south of, of Melites Ditch. Okay, but we'll come, come to this later on. Now, the field walking exercise and this making ex mapping exercise also allowed us to relocate other lost sites. For example, the tomb at Tassat, one, considered one of the Tagnetia group, but in actual fact, quite, quite far away, uh, which is now, uh, we, can, we can say that is part of the road that leads from the roundabout of Tavnezia up towards the roundabout of, of Imtarfa. And this was only possible because we have that photo there in which uh, MD is showing, so we, can, we could literally uh, place it according to the view in, in the photo. And the same thing could be done with only one of the burials at Tavnezia, actual Tavnezia, uh, tomb 2112 on that, on, that, on that photo. And we, I could only do that because you can see the Mosta Dome in the background there. And by walking the area, uh, the only location that the Mosta Dome is visible in that way is from the core, that corner of, of the old, old runway. However, in this case, we were lucky that uh, the other tombs uh, at Tavnezia were listed with the distance between each other, rough distance. So we can place them uh, roughly within, within the, the runway. Remember that these were discovered uh, during the construction of the runway in the 1930s. Now, this exercise also allowed me to identify some undocumented sites. Okay, I'm, I'm giving here some, some examples, uh, the examples that I like most of you, man. Uh, and the first one is El Sayem, uh, which is an area very close to Landreet, where we have uh, this beautiful site with a quarry, a very shallow quarry, only about three courses high, uh, within which are a number of window tombs and small hypogea, small, uh, and we can see the, uh, all of them, all of them here, and a very small hypogeum. With, an, with a, I think, three, three window tombs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and this is one of the, of the sites that has never been documented. I'm sure someone saw it, but never documented in, in literature. Another of the sites is what I dubbed the Aleliya one, on top of Aleliya, Aleliya Hill, where we have, again, evidence of quarrying uh, with two small chambers, possibly window tombs, and two small bench tombs on the front, uh, in front of, of the quarry. At the bottom of Aleliya Hill, on the other hand, we have a very complex system visible on both sides of the road. So this was originally at least one hypogeum and probably three shaft and chamber tombs that were cut uh, during the construction of this road. And this is not a modern road, so it's not, not unfortunately, not one of the projects, the many road projects we have now. Uh, but this road is already documented in, by, by some meat uh, and, and in, the, in the admiralty charts. But we have a hypogeum in plain sight here and at least three chambers that have never been, uh, been, been documented before. All these will be published uh, very, very, very soon. Another big site, huge site, are the quarries and the features at Illunciata, uh, right behind uh, the Carmelite Retreat House where we have a large system of quarries, so those are the green lines, interspersed with cart rats, the pink lines, and a number of features and cavities that may relate to, to shaft and chamber tombs or other hypogea. Okay, of interest is, here is a snapshot of, of the quarry. This is so far the largest uh, document, the largest classical style, Roman style uh, quarry on the island at least in the area of, of Rabat. Uh, within one of the areas, you can see a small door in that rubble, rubble wall there, is a small, the remains of a small hypogeum that, have been, that has been completely uh, hewn out to make space as a field room, but you can clearly identify the apse of a triclinium, and at the back, uh, there are the remains of an obliterated baldacchino, uh, it's not very visible, but I tried my best uh, to illustrate it. Uh, visible through, through the roof. The roof 
is always uh, imperative to study when studying hypogea because it's, it shows the history of the excavation of, of the site, literally. A minute, so I admit people that are still coming in. Okay. Well, after the data capture, uh, I started the analysis. Of course, of course, the first part, this is the, the bit that is still works in progress. So, uh, so we don't have the full picture here, but it is what uh, I've, I've identified so far. So the first most important thing is to identify the relationship between the features, not just tombs, uh, but quarries, for example, and cartridges. And this is in, in Tahleb, the limits of Tahleb, quite close to, to Xayem, the site I showed before. And when you start mapping like this, you start to understand uh, how these features are acting, not just between themselves, but also on the landscape, as we'll see below. Of course, it's not only cartridges uh, and quarries. I've also, I am also studying the relationship between uh, tombs and hypogea. Uh, and the agricultural trenches, what we normally call vine trenches, because the idea was whether we had a garden set up within the cemetery. So far, unfortunately, I have not been able to clearly identify a relationship between tombs and agricultural trenches, at least from the data sets, data sets I, have, I have so far. Okay, but the most important thing is, I keep saying this is looking at the landscape, and understanding the landscape first. We cannot really study features unless, unless we understand the landscape in which, they are, uh, in which they are. And I'm going to illustrate an example here of what I, of what I mean. So here we have a stretch of land between Mtarfa, Aliliya, and, and Nadur. And this is, these are the cartridges. So even by looking at the cartridges in relationship to the landscape setting, you can already start identifying a pattern, a pattern that is following the landscape. So, so they're, at least in most of the parts, they're, they're creating a path through the highest plateaus and then across the uh, Lea Valley, probably towards Imparf, at least from what the cartas at Aleluya are, are showing us and making a full circle, uh, probably, across the high plateau uh, east at uh, west of, of Imtarfa and probably doing a full circle, a full circle towards, uh, towards Melita and, and Imtarfa again. If we add to these the quarries, the picture becomes more, more and more interesting uh, because it, it starts providing a clearer picture of why these rats, rats are here. And then as we go along, we can start inputting all the other features. So the brown dots are other features that are features that are not of the main data set. So here we have cave silos, for example, uh, pipits, oh sorry, uh, post holes, and other features of the sort. Uh, I don't know what I added. Yeah, I, I, these are the agricultural trenches. Sorry, they, they're not very visible. Uh, then we have the shaft and chamber tombs, okay, and we the pattern continues to emerge, particularly around around some of the sites with other features, surface barriers, okay, so barriers on the surface, mostly amphora barriers and cremations, surface cremations. Uh, then we have the shaftless, uh, sorry, the the hypogea, uh, and when you view this. In the larger picture, you get, get the situation. Just to put you in the picture, I managed to catalog, uh, to catalog uh, almost more than 2,500 features that within that single, single area. We're talking about an area of about 20,000 square meters anyway, so it's quite a big stretch of land. Now, another important thing of the analysis is the crooks of the research, from dispersal and clustering. And here I'm focusing on this stretch, which is the main stretch, uh, where we have uh, 
the, the oldest type of berries, remember here, I'm using mostly uh, pump type rather than, than the artifacts because foremost we don't have the artifacts to go with the, with the tomb. So, so we are use, I am using tomb, tomb typology more, more than anything. So here I marked the earliest known. So we have iron clip where number 748 is. We have uh, the isthmus of, of, of Imtarfa. We have the area of Arbarka and uh, over Talvirtu I marked uh, a general area for, for the two chippy uh, discovered centuries ago. If we look then at the later typologies, the later with, with the wider shafts, the stairs, uh, we, we see a, disper a much bigger dispersal of barriers, particularly in the Aliliya plateaus and the Nadur area. And of course, the Ta'ali Ta area where, where the Tafnetsia cluster, cluster is. But at a later stage, we see a clustering of, of the more typical late Punic and Roman, Roman shaft and chamber tombs. So these are the shaft and chamber tombs as we'll see below, later, uh, with very narrow shaft, or no steps, uh, and rectangular, rectangular uh, chamber that all seem to cluster in the plateau south, south of Merlite, with very little occurrence uh, elsewhere. And this pattern of, the, of clustering in the south plateau continues as carried on in, with hypogea. So, so the, it's even clearer with hypogea, where most of the hypogea are continuing the tradition, the earlier tradition. So we see a continuation of the same symmetry between at least three, three typical periods, uh, late Punic, Roman, and, and Byzantine. But we also see other clusters at Einklip, uh, the two sites at Aleliya, uh, Talqsayem, and we see a shift in use, at least from the limited data we have uh, at Ta'ali, between one end of the runway and, and the other. And this end is, for example, where, uh, where the embassy now is. But we can already, even in this very early stage of the data analysis, we can already ident start identifying shifts in patterns of, of symmetries. Now, of course, is the art the task of identifying whether uh, these shifts are happening for particular reasons or other. Is it part of the landscape? Is it ritual? Uh, is it clustering of settlements rather than centralization within the main, main town? Uh, these are all things that I will eventually get to in the next year. Uh, of course, this research, apart from tombs, provided me with peripheral, what I'm calling peripheral data. It's not peripheral because it's still part of the, of the research, but it's sort of secondary, uh, secondary to, to the research. And I'm focusing mostly here on, on the quarries. And we can see, even by this map, that there is or oh, is even here clustering of quarries in the same area as, as the, the last phase of barriers. And, but when you start looking at this uh, geologically, for example, you start noticing that the areas of quarrying are concentrated in, in the areas of exposed Timtarfa member, which was a very soft, a soft stone uh, in the coralline that was primarily used for construction as well for tomb, tomb excavation in the area. And this is even more clear when you, you see it in the digital terrain model. And there is a pattern that, that they are literally stopping when the ground becomes more difficult to transport, they literally stop. So there are no quarries uh, beyond, beyond the site. So even if, if at least the main cluster when, where the 786 and 760 are, if we consider those as part of the quarries feeding the main town, uh, it is, they are easily accessible. All right, you have some ups and downs, but it's not as difficult as if, as like the one, the quarries, for example, at Clapham Junction and, and at Alilia, where you have uh, quite a, a hill, quite a steep hill back up to, to Merlite. 
And of course, this also feeds in into the interpretation of whether the clustering and barriers um, is related to one single habitation cluster or multiple uh, rural clusters around around the main a main town. Okay, now the tomb typology I mentioned before, uh, I'm using so far the typologies brought forward and published by Sagona. And if we consider the shift uh, of the, to the necropolis south of the town's ditch, we are dealing mainly uh, with the typologies from 8 to onwards. So we're talking about the third century BC, and that is when we see this big shift uh, of, of barriers clustering south of, south of the main town, you know, or probably along uh, along one or two or more main main routes, and these are examples of the types of barriers we'll see. This, these are two examples, both from from the Saint Paul's catacombs, for example. But my my typology will also continue within with the hypogea, and for the hypogea, I'm using an amended version of what Bellanti proposes and what Bohajar then uh, took on. So, and this is based on what on the research, on the data I managed to acquire uh, from this research, there appears to be a phase one, which is the modification of existing, existing barriers. And we'll see examples of that. Phase two is the cubiculum style hypogeum, uh, especially those without antechamber and stairs, which are probably an earlier, an earlier phase. And here is, uh, as an example from catacomb six within the Saint Paul's catacombs, and another example of a of a very of still a cubiculum style burial, but in this case instead of a room there is a, a corridor, and this will come into play later on. Uh, I am still uncertain whether this is an earlier phase of the cubiculum or a later phase that then uh, got transposed into corridor corridor hypogea. And unfortunately, unless we find uh, uh, one of these that has been later transformed or with dated build material in it, it will be very, very difficult uh, to, be, to come to a conclusion about this, this issue. What I'm calling phase three is the extended uh, cubiculum style hypogea. So we have an extended central room, okay, with more and more cubicula. This is the most classical example uh, from uh, the Tacha Middle School. And here we have a photo of that. So we have a big room with a number of cubicula set around it instead of the usual, usual tree. And, but we also have an extended cubiculum uh, where it's the burial room itself that got extended. And again, we have a number of examples of this, including both at SPC and, and Santa Agata and the Winyakur. And it is probably from this type that then we pass for to the, the corridor hypogea, particularly the ones with Arcozolia flanking the corridor. Okay, but this type of hypogeum uh, can make use of two main tomb types, so Arcozolium and, and window tomb. Uh, like, for example, here we have uh, the example of catacomb, the earliest example part of catacomb 14 with an SPC and a new hypogeum that will be published later this year uh, that we call cluster 17 at, at the Winya Court, where you have two endotums there along one central corridor. Uh, the last phase is what we call, sorry, called hypogea, where you have uh, the addition of these large rooms with baldacchino mostly placed centrally and architecturally. And I'm showing, for example, this stretch of Hypogeum 16, where you had one single corridor lined with Arcozolia, and then one of the last Arcozolia was, was obliterated to make room for another two baldacchino tombs. And the other section was also uh, a later addition. And this, the most classical example of this is, of course, uh, Abatia Taddeir, uh, where you have uh, this line of baldacchino tombs that create this architectural beauty uh, within our hypogee. What we have missing in Malta, 
and this was not identified by just myself but other scholars, is, is the egalitarian phase within Roman and Sicilian, Sicilian hypogea. So we're missing the phase, the early Christian phase, uh, in which everybody was buried in identical burials. So there was no social differentiation within that in the Christian community. And that is only miss, completely missing in Malta, except possibly for the example uh, of Catacomb 8 uh, at St. Paul's Catacombs. Now, other peripheral data, I know I said ritual would not, would not be, be, be tackled, uh, but I, I still have uh, some considerations to do that I've noticed uh, during my research. First and foremost, that is that with the antechamber and cubiculum uh, hypogea, we also see the introduction of benches, congregation benches in the antechamber. And that is probably why the antechamber, antechamber was, was a necessity. Uh, but from once the cubiculum hypogea ceased to exist, these benches almost disappear, and we start seeing these particular niches. I'm showing here as the first image, the most, the best known one at Santa Agata. Uh, but of these, we have we have quite a number, and these are mostly identifiable. And this is this is the the complete one from Tamintna by this particular hood design. So we have normally a, a plain hood with a very elongated tip in the middle, uh, which Borch a few decades ago uh, interprets altars for the Eucharistic rite being used in tandem with the agave, so with the triclinia. However, Borch did not account for the fact that many of them were later turned into into window tombs. So, so we have quite, can identify quite a number of these niches uh, that seem to have changed use during the course of the years. And we have, we are seeing here examples that the one before was at the Winya Court. This is one that's at Santa Agata, uh, Santa Agata again. So I came up with this new hypothesis. Uh, through by looking through the the evolution of the hypogea in which they are. And I'm using this example from Abaziata there as a clear example. So what we have here is a hypogeum with a triclinium and a number of window tombs. But if you look at the features clearly, you can see that originally the hypogeum was made by a central corridor with two arcosolia on either side. Okay, and in one case, the arcosolium was turned into a niche, and you can still see the re decorated rebate on part of that niche, of that arch, and the different tool marks at the bottom of the pillar, the surviving pillar, show us that uh, there was a different period of use for these, and they, they were hewn, and the different parts were hewn at different periods. Moreover, you can still see part of the arch of the arcosolium, the arc, on the roof, on the roof behind it, the other arcosolium was obliterated when the triclinium was constructed, but even here, if you look closely at the photo above the triclinium, you see a notch, and that is also part of the original, original triclinium, or original arcosolium. Next, at the end of the corridor was an altar niche, uh, that we, similar to the ones mentioned, okay, with decorated pillars and the undecorated, undecorated hood, uh, but at one point in time, the triclinium was uh, installed in this hypogeum. Tomb types change from arcosolia to window tombs, and the altar niche uh, becomes a window tomb itself. So it changes use over, over time, particularly, as we'll see, when the triclinium was constructed. And these niches may find parallels, for example, in... I'm showing here an example of the Sacello Pagano, a particular area, a Sacello originally incorporated within the, within the catacombs of Santa Lucia. And this is an image given to me, thanks by to uh, Dr. David Atanasi. And in this particular area, and we have at least four niches, the use of which was mainly to put offerings uh, within the Sacello 
and this was picked up in the later uh, transformation of this area to hypogeum. So, what I'm, I am proposing, first and foremost, is if, that if we look at the data, most alter niches were later converted into window tombs. Whenever both niches and triclinia are present, the latter, so the triclinia, appear to have been most, most of these niches are also in corridor hypogea, in which triclinia appears an afterthought. So most, in most occasions, and when I say most, there is only one, one exception, uh, these, these niches appear in corridor hypogea, so not in the last, in the last typology, and in which the triclinia is always a later addition. And this brings me to the, to the, to the fact that the triclinia evolved as they are in Malta because they were being imposed onto corridor hypogea. So the only way of putting them in was to extend sideways and, and literally carve these tables out of the living room. So my conclusion is that all niches appear to have been, an, been earlier than triclinia, so not as board said and concurrent, possibly even, even pagan in nature. And could, these could have been used for the placing of uh, ritual objects, offerings, or as shelves for the pagan refrigerium. Uh, that was, we know, was, was still held sometimes within hypogea, uh, particularly in Malta, where we see this continuous evolution uh, between one type and the other. Uh, and in this slide, we can also see the antechamber of, of, the, of the cubiculum hypogea as possibly serving as a congregation, congregation area. I'm putting here a question whether it is possible that the window tomb, which is so unique in Malta, uh, actually, whether they got the design literally from these reused alter niches, uh, which, is, which is a possibility as well, but of course, very, very difficult uh, to confirm. Now, if we try to apply this uh, work for site evolution onto a case study, I'm using here the St. Paul's platforms, of course, is the site that I'm most familiar with, but this can be applied for other, other sites. And then the St. Paul's catacombs, uh, we can literally trace back the history from the very start, and we have the beginning of the site was through quarrying, uh, within which we have a number of surface barriers and chaffing chamber tombs. Re just remember that we have only excavated here uh, almost 15% of the site, and that most of the data is coming from the visitor center area. Uh, and other tombs that were later incorporated or accidentally broken into by later hypogea. So many more might, might still be lurking underneath the soil. Uh, we also have here an example of a modified Chaftain chamber tomb to which uh, two Arcozolia were added in, the, in one of the chambers. So we're seeing another step in the evolution. Uh, then we have Chaftain chamber tombs with cubicula. So cubicula Tiberius, so the earliest form of hypogea, but without stairs and antechamber that come and those come, come later. And we have quite a good a number of examples. And after this, this step, of course, we have the other hypogea that litter, literally litter, litter the area uh, here. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of my presentation. I just wanted to tell you that uh, this will not be the end. So my PhD is not meant to be the end of the research. Uh, and once I finish all, all the GIS database, will be handed over to both Heritage Malt and Superintendents of Culture and Heritage for integration within uh, their, their GIS platforms. With the hope, I'm hoping that this may, be, may serve as a springboard for other researchers, including students from the University of Malta, to extend a similar approach to the rest of the island, possibly in pieces. But uh, I strongly believe that we cannot start to understand our sites without first putting them back into the landscape and the modern way 
the current way of doing this is through a GIS platform as it is done, as it is done here. Before I conclude, I have to thank uh, quite a lot of people, primarily my tutors, Professor Neil Christie and Professor Sarah Scott, who could not join us today, unfortunately. Uh, the superintendents of cultural heritage, the current superintendents, Kirk Farouja, Kevin Borda and Bernardette, who have been instrumental, but also Nathaniel and Maverick, who helped me a lot while they were still at the superintendents. At the University of Malta, Prof. Nicol Nicolas Vellant, Keith Bohajar, because they have been very patient with me whenever I had an idea to, to, to fire up. And of course, Heritage Malta and the Endeavour Scholarship Scheme that is helping me up uh, through, uh, through, through, this, through this research study. And most finally, thanks to you for, for staying with me tonight and hearing my works in progress of my, of my research. And that's the end, unfortunately. Well, I've been talking for an hour. I think I've said enough. So if you have any questions, you can, you can fire up. Well, that's wonderful, uh, David. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. Uh, it's, I mean, a question after my own heart. I love, I love catacombs. Um, and uh, obviously, I've done very little work on them. This is a huge undertaking that you've that you've uh, taken on board, and uh, um, I, 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 I can't wait to see your PhD finished and published. Um, uh, so we look forward to that. Um, there are a couple of questions, I think, in the chat. Let me yes. just check. Uh, so Anne, uh, Anne is asking, did, did you did you find any? Um, sort of reference to, 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 to settlements? Um, uh, not not direct. Your finding? Not, not direct evidence. So I haven't managed to find structures, for example. But by the initial findings, it looks like we might have uh, clusters that may indicate at least a rural, a rural establishment rather than settlements. Uh, so uh, we might have, uh, there is still more data analysis to be done, but uh, we might have clusters that may be indicating at least the presence of small hamlets or farmsteads in the area. Mm -hmm. And um, did, you, did you count all the, all the <laughs> tombs? <laughs> I did not count everyone, but um, it's roughly around 1,500 between tombs and, and hypogea. Yeah, yeah. And probably roughly. many others to, to add to that, probably, at the end of the day. Yeah, we have to bear in mind that a lot of the area is covered in agricultural land. So, so unless we dig there or do remote sensing, it will be very, very difficult for us to, to have a, a full picture. Mm. Um. Anton uh, Bujeya is asking, uh, A, at Sharolla, a link was made between the ancient roads and tombs. Have you found such link in your research area? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. For example, if you see the clustering at Aleliya, uh, the tombs all seem spread, spread around the cartridge. Uh, so there is a link uh, between cartridge and, and barriers. Even at the, the St. Paul's catacombs, uh, we have literally a small section, two meters, of a set of cartridges running through, through the site. But this is quite, it's becoming quite common. There's, there's a clear link, uh, link between them. Not just them, but even quarries. Uh, so, so the cases of Salina and Tabaziata there are not chance, uh, chance sites but they're specifically choosing quarries for the insertion of tombs uh, and hypogea. And this is something that is also happening elsewhere in Rome and in Sicily. Uh, so they're finding these areas of exposed rock where quarries had previously been constructed, uh, uh, been dug to start a burial, a necropolis. Mm -hmm. uh, in one case at Tabistra, for example, we have a quarry uh, that was used as a as an acropolis while the quarry was still in use. So so there's quite a clear link, clear link there. Um, 
Anton again, did you find any tombs uh, on the Mdina side of the Roman ditch in Rabat? I noticed two. I think I noticed two spots. I'm not quite sure what they were. Uh, not, not exactly. Uh, those were not, not tombs. So, so not, not actual burials, no. Not on that side. Mm. So far. Mm. Or at least as far as I could tell. Uh, the two spots, one of them is marking the ossuary found uh, near Greek's Gate, where the Valeria tablet uh, was, was discovered. Mm. Nobody is sure of its authenticity, of the site's authenticity, not the tablet, mm. uh, but it's documented, so I listed it. But other than that, we have, we have nothing so far. Mm. Um, Keith again, another question. There are hypogea containing locally tombs in the Val di Noto area in Sicily. But these, at least from the impression I have, are generally the exception and not the norm. Any comments on this? Any possible correlation with Malta? Well, then the egalitarian phase is... is particular in Sicily, and they, for example, uh, there is a particular catacomb, the name escapes me at the moment, where they literally have a corridor type hypogeum with different phases of Arcosolia, so not the local style. Uh, in Sicily, it, there is very limited evidence, as Keith said, of, of a hypogea with, with just locally, locally in them. On, on the other hand, they seem to have predilected the Arcosolium, all right, in most cases, and it's the different type of Arcosolium that then is defying the, the stages of, of construction. Uh, in Malta, we seem to have to have the same. In my opinion, the first, the earliest phase of corridor, Hypogeum, is the Arcosolium, and we can see also the Arcosolium in the antechamber type uh, Hypogea, uh, and then only at a later stage uh, do we find the window tombs in most cases. So if you look at a lot of hypogea, uh, the window tombs are either in extensions or in areas that have been modified. Okay, if if the hypogeum contains uh, window tombs, it's mostly uh, from the start. It's mostly mostly in conjunction with other features that seem to indicate a later stage, like the baldacchino, and as I explained, possibly the the triclinia. So uh, we have a lot of similarities with, uh, with, uh, with Sicily, particularly the Syracuse in Hypogea. So uh, as we can tell from the letters of Pope Gregory, Malta appears to have been part of the Sea of Syracuse, uh, at least by the sixth century. So, so we might be sharing ideas between Syracuse and Malta. Uh, not just Malta, because in Rome there's a single window tomb that the Italians ascribe to Maltese influence in Rome. So, so how the Maltese influence might have been spreading uh, quite a lot, actually. Mm. I, I, was, I often wonder about the, um, the idea of whose land it was. I, is there any indication that when these tombs were being built, there were constraints because of, of ownership. Uh, it, can one see any, obviously one doesn't know what was owned by whom, but can one imagine that there might have been constraints because of, of, of ownership? Well, that is easier done in Rome, uh, where you have literally the largest hypogea being established in, in estates owned by rich converts, and that are donating literally their land uh, to the community, to the Christian community, uh, for burial. Uh, so, so in Malta, that's a bit more difficult. I'm sure that if we have a clearer picture, uh, we can start identifying uh, property lines. But it's very, very difficult. Uh, unless you find what lies on the surface, it will remain very, very difficult. Uh, remember that in Rome, you have areas where we have an earlier necropolis than an, uh, a suburban establishment. Uh, 
then the underground is given to hypogea, and then when the basilica, basilicas, the martyrial basilicas start to be constructed, you have this shifting of the necropolis to the surface again. Mm-hmm. So understanding that <laughs> is, is crucial. In Malta, at least from the parts of the hypogea that we have excavated, for which we have data from the top, we don't seem to have that shift. So once they go underground, they remain underground. They, we don't have, at least we don't have evidence for a shift of burial practices back up on the surface. Plus, mm-hmm. our hypogea continue longer. So, so we have evidence of use up to at least uh, the 6th or early 7th century uh, burial use. So, so uh, we cannot really compare to Rome here. Yeah? We cannot really compare. Mm-hmm. Um, before you mentioned that there might be this connection with the, with the cart ruts, and uh, I, I was thinking of the, as well, Eugene is asking about um, Bronze Age cart ruts and late, later, in the vertical as possible, Roman... No, because it wasn't the spoke, and it's very, they're very difficult to, to identify. Uh, or, all I can say that is that I, I've identified two main types of cart ruts, one that is roughly uh, one, one, one meter 27 or 130 wide, and one that is approximately 140. And you often find them in conjunction with each other. So it's, it is very, very difficult to identify uh, the age of such rats. I still believe that there should be considered multi-period, because that's the most logical solution. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't dealt into the distinguishing between uh, older and earlier, because I don't believe there is a foolproof technique for that. So at the moment, yeah. Um, uh, Anne's asking uh, um, just a clarification regarding uh, the undocumented sites. Um, do you mean nobody's seen them before, or that nobody made a note of them? Just a clarification over that. Yeah, by undocumented, I see that they don't appear in any literature. Doesn't mean that nobody. Nobody has seen them, uh, but nobody has made a note or documented them anywhere. So for us, they're un- undocumented, literally. Uh, there is no document to show, to show for them. Mm, that's interesting. Um, I don't know whether there was a question that I missed, and, but I don't know whether you're seeing the questions yourself. Yeah, I'm seeing the questions. Let me check. I think. No. Or something else that I think I missed. Uh, Keith, uh, the first question of Queen. Keith. Uh, whether we have datable cultural material to support the typological evolution. Yeah, At the moment, as I said, unfortunately, we don't have enough data from both shaft and chamber tombs and, uh, and, uh, and hypogea. So, so the evolutions I'm, I'm, I presented here are based uh, primarily on the studies of other researchers like Sagona and from, particularly in the hypogea, from the phasing that I could discern within the hypogeum themselves. Uh, so if you know what to look for, you can identify how a hypogeum was, has evolved. So, so most uh, of my hypotheses come from, from that point of view. I would have loved to have datable material uh, for our burials, but even at the St. Paul's Catacombs, datable material is very, very, very scarce. So unfortunately, unless we find uh, any good uh, sealed, sealed hypogea, or at least tombs with, uh, with material still in them, it will be very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. But of course, one always keeps his fingers crossed in the hope that, that we'll find something. Absolutely. Well, you never know. Um, you never know. <laughs> just uh, there's a new message here. Let me see. Let me see. Um, there should be settlements. I think we already answered that before. Uh, no, we did. Uh, no, the answer was not really. Yeah, not really, but at, at, except for the third century onwards, where we have the clustering at, around the main, the main town, south of the main town. So over there, we know. Uh, that at least the main town was was at its limits uh, and and urbanized at that time probably 
Mm. It's interesting. I'm always interested yeah, in the idea of the, the triclinear uh, pe- pe- uh, you know, pagan or, or Christian. Um, I mean, where do, you, where do you sort of drop on that subject, really? I mean... <laughs> I think we can see. I, I think we can see a continuous line of the of the of the ritual, at least from from the second century BC. Uh, for example, at the Saint Paul's Catacombs, we found an almost complete piglet buried with an a cremation, missing its hind legs, which were probably mm-hmm. eaten. And in my opinion, uh, in my opinion. The antechamber of antechamber and curriculum hypogea was possibly serving as a congregation uh, place primarily for this purpose. So I think it was a continuation of the silicerium, the refrigerium that was then taken up uh, by Christians uh, as, as the agape ritual, in mm. my opinion. Mm. Um, Sandra Dingley is asking. Uh... What criteria did you use to select the periphery of your research area? Good question. Well, well, we tried, with my supervisors, we tried to get a catchment of both low-lying areas and high-lying areas. And the high-lying areas, so the areas south and west of Melite, or of the Narabad, and Mantarfa, uh, the limit was mostly the cliff edge. There's a quite a sharp cliff edge, and we use that as a limit. Uh, whereas in other areas, we try to keep a roughly homogeneous, uh, homogeneous radius, but of course, in keep keeping with features on the side, on the on the landscape. So, in most cases, in the other areas, it was roads and field bound, current field boundaries, uh, because we had some, we needed something to tie to tie with. But we tried mm-hmm. to keep. Uh, a good buffer around around the main the main town. Um, just I'm going to slip in another question. Um, the you showed us some very beautiful um, superimpositions of of uh, cart ruts with water sources and tombs, etc. Um, the, the 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 springs that um, you you found did you. Did you see connections with those springs at all or not? Well, first and foremost, the springs were discovered by Keats research. Yeah. Uh, I was just handed on the GIS file and uploaded them, so it, it's not my doing. Uh, but yes, there seems to be some clustering, particularly in the Ein Klip area, uh, that are closely close, at least close to, to the springs at the time. Uh, so those may also reflect the presence of, of, of settlements or at least hamlets or farmsteads. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said, I'm still in the early stages of data analysis, so, so I still need to run all the data then through, through GIS and uh, view shed analysis and etc. Uh, but there seems to be, initially, there seems to be uh, a connection. Of course, it, it comes at no surprise if there is good arable land and good water, uh, people will use it. Uh, and if we have suburban farmsteads, uh, the practice was to bury within the limits, the confines of the farmstead in the Roman period. So at least in the Roman period. Uh, so so it's, it comes at no surprise in that, in that way. Absolutely. Um... Gosh, another one, a very quick one, because we really, <laughs> everyone will, will, will want to be going for, your, for their supper. Um, uh, uh, if, the, if the triclinia came later, was the floor further depressed? In, in, in some cases, yes. Uh, in some cases, yes. And they preferred to lower the floor rather than the roof. And we're lucky in that because the roof then holds the map to the evolution of the site. Uh, but since they were retouching the floor anyways, uh, they prefer to touch the floor. Remember, though, that uh, they did not necessarily need to lower the floor uh, by much because the lower part of the arcosolia was solid rock still. So they could literally carve, if there was an arcosolium, they could carve in that 
uh, in that chunk of solid rock. So the height of the corridor uh, ma might have remained literally the same. Well, I think that Keith has a last, uh, really last question. I think since he provided the information on the springs, we ought to, um, uh, 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 we ought to bring it up. On springs, let's keep in mind, his comment is, that perched aquifer water was always present in the area, but what we are looking at now are modified springs connected to the later medieval period, fiefs or viridaria. So, okay. comment about that. I think what he is saying is that the locations of the springs might not necessarily reflect the locations of the springs in, in the Roman period. But at this point, it's the what we have to work with. So, so. yeah. Okay, so I come to the end. I, I, I'm, uh, I was absolutely fascinated. It's an enormous piece of work, and I, I embark a loop off of the rest of it. That's it. We look, we look forward to, um, to seeing the, the end, the end product. Thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you all. Uh, we had a lovely group today from, from Malta and various abroad and other places. So that's fantastic. Um, as I said, this is the last in the season se lecture series. Um, but for those of you who are resident in Malta, we have a special seminar coming up. And we do hope many of you will be able to attend. The seminar will be held on Saturday, 28th May, uh, with three presentations to be given by officials of the Superintendents of Cultural Heritage. Uh, the title of the seminar is An Update on the Recent Activity of the Superintendents of Cultural Heritage. And the speakers will be um, Mr. Kevin Borda, who's head of the National Inventory Research and Archaeology Unit, and also um, Ms. Bernadette Merci Aspiteri, who's senior, senior executive uh, and at the same unit, and Mr. Paolo Spadaro, uh, executive officer um, at, uh, at, at the unit as well. Uh, it will be held at the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta. We thank the Heritage Malta for that. And uh, it will be held between 8.45 and 1 o'clock. And details will be shortly on the Facebook and, uh, and the website. So, um, sincere thanks from the Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology, University of Malta, to David. Thank you so much. Thank you to um, all. To you all of you tonight, it's been a pleasure. Great, great stuff. For the um, yeah, it's been a it's been a fascinating to, to talk. Follow us, continue to follow us on Facebook and on our website, everybody. And thank you so much. And good night. And see you <laughs> online again in October.